you have found Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians chapter number 1. We're going to begin tonight thinking about grace. We're going uh, to be looking at a rejoicing grace. A rejoicing grace. You know, grace, think about this statement. Grace changes everything. Grace changes everything. When God bestows grace on us, it transforms not only our eternal destiny, but grace also impacts the way we live our lives and it impacts how we interact with other people. I, I just prayed it. I hadn't planned on praying it, but I, I just prayed that. You know, God extends grace to us every single day when we don't deserve it. And, and I'm thankful for that. But you know what? I, I have a problem sometimes being like Jesus and extending grace to other people as he's extended grace to me. And, you know, obviously the Bible tells us that we're to forgive others as Christ Jesus has forgiven us. And, and I'll, I'll tell you what, forgiveness and grace is a supernatural act. Amen? Well, as we look at Paul's letter to the church at Colossae, we're going to draw some lessons about grace for our daily lives. Look at verse number 1 in chapter number 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth, as ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Now, Paul's epistle to the Colossians is, is unusual because Paul did not uh, start the church at Colossae. He had heard of their faith, he says right here. But he didn't win on personally. The pastor of the church at Colossae was a man by the name of Epaphras. Many scholars believe that he was saved at Ephesus and then he traveled to Colossae and it was there in Colossae that he started this church. Epaphras visited Paul while Paul was imprisoned in Rome. And during that visit, most Bible scholars believe that Paul wrote this letter for Epaphras to take back to the congregation at Colossae. Now, because of the prevalence of false teaching in their culture, Paul wanted to take time to encourage these Christians to develop and to mature in their faith, almost like he's doing with the church at Corinth that we're studying on Sunday mornings. He began and ended his letter of encouragement with grace. If you go to the end of this letter, you will see him closing as he began, and he emphasizes grace. So to counter the influences of their culture, the church at Colossae, they needed God's grace just as you and I need God's grace today. Amen? Now I want you to listen to this next statement. Living apart from the power of grace will always result in negative feelings in our life. Living apart from the power of God's grace in our life, you'll get discouraged. You'll get downtrodden. You'll, you'll even be depressed. Our lives don't have to be characterized by these things. We can live with peace and joy instead of living like those who don't know God's grace. In chapter 2 of Colossians, you may want to turn there, but you don't have to. I'm going to read verses 8 and 9 to you. The Bible says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You don't have to look far to realize that churches today, in large part, 
are adopting the world's philosophies rather than remaining faithful to the doctrines of Jesus Christ that we find in the Word of God. Now here's what's happening. The, the, what happens is when the church begins to take on uh, the appearance of the world instead of the church uh, uh, reaching out into the world, when we begin to look like the world, we become spoiled. Now when I say spoiled, I, I'm not talking about rotten fruit. I'm talking about spoiled in the way that an invading army carries treasures away. That they spoil the, the enemy's treasures. Trusting human wisdom and understanding rather than trusting God's word spoils us, spoils us of the riches and the rejoicing that come through grace. It, it takes it away from us. It, it's a, a thief. So... We're going to look at the riches of grace Paul describes right here in the book of Colossians. Number one, and this is the only point we'll get to tonight, I want you to write this down. Notice the presence of saving grace. There's the presence of saving grace. Saving grace is the most important aspect of God's grace. There's not a more important aspect of the grace of God than saving grace. Notice Paul starts his letter. Notice what he says. Grace and peace be unto you. That, that is always God's order. You will never have the peace of God until you first experience the grace of God. It's always grace and then peace. Apart from grace, there's no peace with God. And so the Colossians had experienced saving grace. And because they had... They had access to the power of God working in their lives. And that's something that we need to remember. If we've been saved, we have access to the very grace of Almighty God working in our lives. Now, what does the Bible tell us about the presence of grace in our lives? First of all, it commences at faith in Christ. That, that's when the, the presence of saving grace happens. It, it commences at faith in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Many of you have these two verses memorized. Paul said, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, what is it? It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That tells me that when I get to heaven... And I'm there, and I, and I see all these other saints that are there. I'm not going to be able to boast in what I did down here on earth as that to being the reason that I got, got in heaven. No, Paul says, By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. So I'll not be able to strut around heaven saying, well, this is what I did to get here. What did you do to get here? No, it's all by the grace of Almighty God. The only way to obtain grace is to receive it as a gift from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not earned. It's not merited. Complete trust in Him is the only way to experience God's saving grace. Grace is God's part in salvation. Faith is my part in salvation. Amen? So men are always seeking to earn salvation, but, but being baptized, being, uh, uh, doing good works, giving to the poor, living a moral life, even joining a church, that, that does not get us one single step closer to heaven. Do you know that? That doesn't get us one single step closer to heaven. We have nothing to boast of in regard to our salvation. We're not saved because of what we do. We are saved because of what He has done. And what did He do? He died on the cross as a sacrifice for my sin. Amen? So it's not by what I've done. It's all because of who He is and what He's done. Uh, you've heard the name Martin Luther. Martin Luther at one time was a Roman Catholic monk. And he struggled with the weight of his sin. And unable to find relief through the Roman Catholic teachings of penitence and things like that, Luther found the truth in the Bible. He was reading the Bible and he read from Romans chapter 1 verse 17. And he began to meditate on the phrase, The just shall live by faith. 
And it dawned on him, actually it didn't dawn on him, the Holy Spirit revealed it to him. He understood God's freely offered grace and he put his faith in Christ alone for salvation. And in that moment, the truth of grace began to spark a great reformation of the Bible and Bible believers. So saving grace commences at faith in Christ, but second of all, it continues throughout eternity. Now notice in verse 5, Paul talks about the hope laid up for us. Who? Believers. The church. Hope laid up for us in heaven. Paul's, Paul's not referring to our hope of going to heaven. Now that's a great thing, amen? <laughs> Going to heaven is a wonderful assurance I have for being saved, but that's not what he's talking about. He's referring to the rejoicing we will experience. Think about this. The rejoicing we will experience when we enter into the presence of God. When we see the Lamb upon His throne. Those of us who are saved have so much waiting for us to enjoy. And for all of eternity, we will continue to enjoy the riches of God's grace. Continues throughout eternity in a heavenly home. In a heavenly home. John 14 verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Listen to this. That where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus Christ has made us a promise. He has made every born-again believer a promise. That promise is one day He will take us to a place He has prepared and we will be with Him throughout all of eternity. Forever and forever. He made a personal promise. And I'm telling you, every promise of God is really a guarantee. If He promised it, He guarantees it, it's going to happen. You can uh, uh, bet the farm on it, amen, if you're a betting man. One day soon, we're going to see the beauty of heaven because of His grace. In our eternal home, there'll be no sorrow. There's no pain. There's no death. John tells us that in the book of Revelation, chapter 21. And so this promise gives us comfort and hope no matter the circumstances that we face. I read a story about a grandmother who took her granddaughter out for a walk on a beautiful moonlit evening. On this particular night, the stars were magnificent. As they walked together, she named individual stars and constellations for her granddaughter. As they looked up, at, looked up at the sky, her granddaughter exclaimed, Grandma, if the bottom side of heaven is this beautiful, just think how wonderful the top side must be. The saving grace continues throughout eternity, not just in a heavenly home, but it continues throughout eternity for all who believe. All. Everyone who believes. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 16. Now our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. John 1, 17. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Christ Jesus. Every single person, without exclusion, every person who has placed his faith in Jesus has the hope of an eternal home in heaven. Those who've gone before us in faith, they're, they're already enjoying what we're looking forward to. Heaven is our hope for the future, and because it is the promise of God, it is sure, just as if we were already there. Heard an old preacher one time in a preaching conference, and he said, I'm just as assured of heaven as if I was kicking up gold dust on Hallelujah Boulevard right now. Amen? So with that hope, lifting our spirits and the Holy Spirit bearing fruit in our lives, we can have grace to lift up His name in song, lift up His name in praise, expressing our thanks in worship from hearts of love. And so as we acknowledge and live in the presence of saving grace, we gain access to the power of what we're going to look at next week, and that is the power of of singing grace. We've got access to it and our worship brings honor and glory to Him. I, I just want to say something about that. May we always come to the house of God and be looking for our Savior. 
We are so entertainment driven today in the church. And, and we begin to think that we come as spectators to see a show. That's not what it's about. When people are up here singing, they're singing for the glory of God. You should be worshiping for the glory of God. Now, certainly they bless us. They, they bless us. They encourage us. But listen, we're not at a show. We're not at a concert. We are meeting together to worship Almighty God. We have an audience of one. Amen. Our Father, we love you tonight. Lord, thank you so much for grace. And Lord Jesus, it is a rejoicing grace. We have much to rejoice in because of the riches of your grace. Lord Jesus, I thank you that I have the presence of saving grace in my life. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that on the day that I gave my heart to you as a young college freshman, I'm glad when I called out to you, Lord Jesus. You didn't make me get better. You took me as I was. You washed me and cleansed me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for that grace. I thank you that I've got a home in heaven awaiting me. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that I can stand behind this pulpit and preach your gospel and tell everyone that I see in me and that I preach to that they too can experience your saving grace. God, may we not keep it to ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.